Okay, everybody, welcome to the, the weekly meeting of the ERA committee. Um, we're Corrid, and uh, one of the members of the committee will be recorded and broadcast through Parliament Buildings and Online. We welcome to use your mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and muted. Um, I have no apologies, and uh, Chairperson's Business, there, there's an act of remembrance at 10.55 uh, <coughs> this morning, and members are in agreement. I propose that we suspend the meeting at 10.50 to allow anyone who wishes to attend the service to do so, do so and reconvene at 11.30 if it's okay. Okay. Um, Sustrans e-bike trial. Uh, you'll be aware the committee was invited to attend the Sustrans event yesterday and representatives of Sustrans were present to brief the committee on their work with a particular focus on the active travel programme. And um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the photographs of a few of us out the front of the building on the on the e-bikes, so um, I think that was it was it was very helpful and uh, interesting event, and insightful, and uh, marks the, the last of the, our series of events to mark the COP26. So, members, if you're okay, I think we should uh, write to Sustran to thank them for the presentation and the demonstration. Uh, Philip. Yeah, I mean, I completely occur with the the event yesterday. It was very useful, uh, but at the presentation prior to the cycling. There was a bit of a discussion around funding around the the hubs. Active hubs. So, uh, so I think that from the committee's point of view, we should definitely keep that on the agenda, uh, and maybe even write to the department in relation to funding and the sustainability of funding, and even ask them what other projects are they funding or potentially funding in relation to assisting active travel. Um, do you think we should contact write DFA as well, maybe? Or? Yeah, I think so. Uh. Yeah, I think the, the active travel hub was a, was a great concept and was well explained yesterday. It would be nice to see those right across the north, wouldn't it? Members okay with that? Yeah. Um, okay, members. Um, okay, item uh, five then is direct payment to farmer simplification regulations 2022. I want to draw your attention to the papers and the table pack. We discussed the proposed changes in our meeting last week and the regulations were laid in the business office on Monday, the this Monday the 8th there past. So, um, are we are members okay? We refer these regulations to the examiner for statutory rules for consideration. Yeah. Okay. Um, draft minutes is the um, the fourth of October, November, eight six. Can I seek agreement for the minutes? Agreed. Okay. I'll sign and get them to you, Nick. And no matters arising. Uh, can I seek agreement that the committee now move to close session to continue informal deliberations. Great. Okay, members. Um, welcome back after the uh, our our short recess there. Um, members, we're at item number seven. Are we are we call it. Yeah. Item number seven here on the agenda is uh, a written briefing um, from Dara, the support scheme for animal establishments. It's page eighty three of your packs. And it's a written briefing on a proposal for COVID support for animal establishments like zoos, open farms, kennels and catteries. The rationale of this is that these establishments have been able to avail of government support despite having to continue providing shelter, feed and veterinary care for animals. DIRA has now appointed a team to scope out these proposals as anticipated that the total cost of the scheme will be approximately 2.5 million, which is hoped to be met with an existing COVID-19 market support budget. Um, Members, anything want to uh, mention about that, or are you just checking the um, the WhatsApp facility here? Okay. Um, so, can I suggest that um, the committee writes to Dara and the Department of Finance and support their proposal. Okay. Okay, members. Uh, this written briefing at number eight. It's the uh, EU Commission's Fit for Fifty Five package. Um, as at page 89 of your packs, written briefing on the Commission's package, which is European Union Commission's plan to reduce emissions by 55% by uh, 2030. This is relevant because the single electricity market on the island, uh, the electricity generators here, will be subject to the Fit for 55 provisions as they remain part of the EU emissions trading scheme. I'd like to draw members' attention to several aspects of the provisions. And namely, NA generators, uh, electricity generators, were subject to more stringent emissions caps by a, reduc a reduction of 
4.3% per year to achieve an overall reductions target of 61% by 2030. There's currently no agreement to link the EU and the UK ETS. Um, Fit for 55 will uh, introduce a carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, whereby a charge will be levied on imports from outside the EU in respect of steel, aluminium, iron, cement and electricity to reduce carbon leakage. This could be expanded to other industries. This raises potential questions about exports from the north to the EU in the absence of a link between the EU and the UK ETS. And the Commission proposes to combine non-CO2 emissions from agriculture with land use, thereby creating a newly regulated sector covering emissions from agriculture, forestry and land use. Nick, do you want to um, elaborate on, on that there, a little bit more detail? Ch Chair, thank you. Yes, it was just um, to draw members' attention. There's a few potential issues highlighted um, in, in this uh, Fit for 55 um, provision. Um, and uh, the first one is that because there is currently no agreement to link the UK and EU emissions trading schemes, um, that potentially um, there's a possibility that the proposed carbon border adjustment mechanism um, could be applied in theory to goods that are in, in the future imported from um, outside of the European Union into the European Union and that could apply to goods potentially generated and produced in Northern Ireland um, and that could have a range of potential consequences um, and then it was to highlight as, a, as an item of interest potentially for the committee we've heard through our calls for evidence from the agricultural sector that all of the, um, the, car, the net sequestration that is done by agriculture in terms of emissions accounting is currently attributed to the land use, land use change and forestry sector um, and what they have strongly advocated that that sh potentially could be reviewed and looked at and it, it's, it's, it's indicated in the Fit for 55 package that the, um, the EU Commission is looking to merge the emissions profiles from agriculture and land use, land use change so as you have a effectively that will be treated as one. Um, so those were two areas in particular the committee may be um, interested in and may be minded to, to correspond with uh, relevant departments on. Okay. Um, thanks for that there. Um, so, um, Can I ask a question? Sorry, Philip, go ahead. And I'm asking it knowing that we're, there's nobody here, but I mean, it, for example, say, say that trade deal that the British government did recently with New Zealand and Australia. If you, if you were if you were a member of the EU, would that then you know that type of deal would put a tariff onto, for example, agricultural prog products coming into the EU? Chair, yes. The, at the minute, the the Fit for Fifty Five package says that they're going to the EU uh, will commence the carbon border adjustment on aluminium, iron, cement, electricity at at the start but with future provision to add other industries in, in the future. Um, and I suppose, it, I suppose I thought it might, might be worth uh, potentially clarifying with the Department of Energy and Investment uh, in, in England to see if there are any plans to merge the two emissions trading schemes. So, uh, in effect, everybody that has given evidence to us, carbon leakage is a big issue, as you would rightly expect. And it's something that the EU are actively trying to come up with a solution. So they're coming up with a solution. Unfortunately, we have left the EU and, and the British government are taking the opposite approach, where they're actually actively encouraging carbon leakage. And, uh, that's just a wee political point. Okay. Um, Rosemary? Rosemary? Thank you. Look, I think this needs a lot, a lot further discussion. I think we need to maybe look at, at the views of other departments too in relation, in relation to this. Particularly if we're, particularly if we're going to, go go ahead with this. You know, you know, we we are a country here that imports steel and then export, exports it again. And I think. Uh, that our industry could be badly affected by this, so we need it's something we need to give a lot more thought on. And perhaps bring in 
look at the Department of Economy and what they have to say? Um, the, the proposal right to the Department of Economy, good idea, Rosemary. Um, yeah. Do you think, Nick, just seeing your assessment of this here, you know, uh, what, what, um, is there any implications for the protocol this year? Chair, um, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I think it mm. would be, um, I did think about that, and um, uh, the, the memo that we received through um, from the department is unclear as to how the protocol regulations will be affected by this, and I suppose um, that's why I thought it's maybe as a suggestion in the first instance um, we could seek clarity on whether there's any likely to be any move in the next few months to try and uh, align the UK and EU emissions trading schemes yeah. as a first step, um, and then we could keep it on the agenda and take it from there. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a couple of actions then, the contact the Department and the Department of Economy, and better what Rosemary said there. Okay, members? Okay, thank you. Okay, members? Um, uh, okay. So we're going to write to the DERA and the Department of Economy um, and this, and maybe BEIS as well, Nick? Certainly, also sure, yeah. and If they have any proposal to merge the British and the EU ETS. Okay, members, um, item nine then is written briefing from DERA, the draft environment strategy. Page 170 of your PACS um, is, uh, uh, for PACS is a letter from the Department outline the exact approval of the draft of the strategy. Clark's uh, summary memo was included at page 108. A copy of the draft strategy is also at page 114. Nick, do you want to take the opportunity to brief the committee? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I appreciate um, that this uh, was discussed last week in committee um, where we received an in the intent from the department to publish the strategy. And indeed, I believe the minister made a statement of this regard to the House <laughs> earlier this week. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, to members, some of the obviously the environment strategy sets out a very high level aspirations across a range of environmental measures and targets, um, and I thought it would be worthwhile just to highlight some of the more prescriptive actions and targets that are in the strategy and compare those with recommendations and advice that is out there from expert bodies. So, um, on page one hundred and nine. Of, um, through to 110 of the packs, um, it sets out the six outcomes of the uh, environment strategy, along with the more um, tangible actions and targets that are listed. Um, so, just as a as a as a as by way of example, um, relevant to our work, um, we're we're expecting the first clean air strategy to be published in 2022. Um, the ammonia strategy um, is, is described as being upcoming and will be uh, hopefully published in due course. Um, there's also provisions around um, uh, using 30% of land and water to be protected for nature by 2030, seeking to increase our woodland cover to 8.8% by 2030, um, and um, a provision that all semi-natural peatlands will be conserved or restored to healthy functioning ecosystems by 2040. Um, so the, that's a flavour of some of the provisions and the, and the, and the ambitions that set out in the environment strategy. And I just want to take the opportunity to draw members' attention on pages, page 111 um, as to how those maybe compare with some of the recommendations um, from expert advice. So the UK Committee on Climate Change in June 2021 um, published its progress report on um, emissions reduction and made several recommendations that are relevant to the devolved nations. That includes one in re relation to peatland restoration. Um, so it's uh, fairly prescriptive and it says that 17% of upland peat um, is restored by 2025. And by 2035, um, there should be 700,000 hectares across the United Kingdom restored and the remaining area by 2045. It also recommends that 12% um, of lowland peat used for crops by 2025 
should be re-wet and sustainably managed, and that rising to 38% by 2035. Um, and um, to remove all low productive trees from peatland and restore all peat extraction sites by 2035. Um, and just by way of comparison, the the environment strategy sets out locally that all semi-natural peatlands are conserved or restored to healthy functioning ecosystems by 2040. Um, and I just thought that, that there was a fair disparity there between what the environment strategy says and the and the recommendation from the CCC. Um, also, in terms of reforestation. Um, the CCC recommends that, um, that in order to meet the emissions targets, there's new woodland to create at least 30,000 hectares per year across the UK by 2025, and to deliver 40,000 hectares of new woodland per year uh, by the 2030s. We also heard um, from the Woodland Trust a number of months ago that in order to support climate goals locally, uh, there, we needed to pursue a forestry level of around 16 to 18 per cent. Um, and in comparison, then, the ambition, as outlined in the draft strategy, is to increase Northern Ireland wood cover, woodland cover to 8.8 per cent. And that's from a ba by 2030, which is from a baseline of 8 per cent. Um, in terms of the recycling measures, um, there's fairly prescriptive recommendations for the Northern Ireland Executive in the CCC's progress report. Um, and it recommends that there should be a, setting a target for 70% recycling rate across all types of wastes by 2030, um, as well as policies to deliver on that target and bringing forth legislation to ban um, the biodeg biodegradable waste going to landfill from 2025. Um, the strategy sets out a number of measures um, around recycling rates, um, but they're limited to in increasing the recycling of packaging from 60 per cent to 78 per cent by 2030 and of drinks containers from 70 per cent to 90 per cent by 2028 um, and there's no provision for an overall uh, for all types of waste to be included in the recycling measures um, and I suppose those were just a number of, of areas at a first glance for uh, some of the um, the more tangible targets and actions that set out in the environment strategy certainly on the face of it, appeared to be um, quite different to what's been recommended um, as to what should be best practice and, and sought for in environmental standards. And I just thought it was important to highlight those to the committee. Um, thank you for that, Nick. And I do, you know, I do think that some of the targets are, are, are much less ambitious than what's been recommended by advisory bodies. And if we take, <laughs> if we take the reforestation, you know, they're proposing to uh, increase from 8% to 8.8% .8 by 2030. So we're only proposing to increase um, reforestation by 0.8% in the next nine years. It doesn't seem to be very ambitious. So, you know, perhaps I could suggest um, that maybe we should maybe ask the Department of Officials to do an oral briefing with us. Um, you know, before the consultation closes, what does members, all our members think? Absolutely, they could really support that one. Yeah. A number of measures, and even on the recycling, um, there's no measures there in terms of reducing. You know, so recycling in its own mm. is not, you know, the, the big impact. It, it's about reduction yeah. and reusing. I, I'm shocked that the department aren't following the advice of the CCC. <laughs> Are you really? <laughs> <laughs> Good observation. <laughs> so, uh, remember, uh, uh, sir, uh, in, in addition to the points made, look, I accept that it does say they're publishing the new waste management strategy by 2023, but as I've raised before and will continue to raise, we are nowhere near consistency on recycling as is expected by people across the different areas of Northern Ireland who want to recycle and who want to do their best and who want to have it collected on their doorstep, like their neighbours in a different council or even sometimes their neighbours um, within the same council area who get a system which isn't ruled out across the entire area. And the department needs to make clear how we're going to deliver on that. Okay. So um, thank you for that, John. 
So are members okay that, that we go with the idea that we ask the departmental officials to give us an oral briefing on this before the consultation closes? Yep. Okay. Thank you for that, everybody. Okay, members, we're moving on now to item number 10, it's an oral briefing uh, from st other stakeholders on the Climate Change Number 2 Bill. Uh, we have a joint presentation by a number of key stakeholders on the Climate Number 2 Bill, and I'd like to... Um, no. uh, I'd like to draw your attention to a supporting memo from Clark at page 193 of your back. Members, you'll also find two briefing papers from AFBE at pages 203 and 213, and a briefing paper by Sustainable um, uh, NA is at your, on your table papers. So I'd like to welcome by um, Starleaf uh, Mr. Uh, Neil Hutchison from the Federation of Small Businesses. Mr. Ray uh, Parmenter, uh, Mr. Neil McCauley, Mr. Tim Walker from the Chartered Institute of Waste Management, Do Dr. Uh, Anika Clements from Ulster Wildlife Trust, and Ms. Nicola Hughes from uh, Sustainable LMNI. And you're very welcome to the committee. And um, we very much welcome your engagement and support on the matter and scrit up in our scrutiny of the bill. And the way we'll work the session today is that one representative from each organisation will provide a, a short summary of your organisation's views on Climate Bill Number 2 for, say, three or four minutes. And I'm proposing that we will start off with uh, Neil uh, Hutchison and then move on to Ray, Anika and Nicola. And after we've heard from all the groups, we'll open for discussion, up for questions and answers from the members. And uh, so following open statements, m members will ask questions. So, do uh, you want to just kick off there, um, Neil? Uh, yes, Chair, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Super. Uh, good, good morning, committee members and staff. Thank you very much for having FSB here today as part of this uh, group presentation. Uh, the, the guidance today noted we should speak for a, a maximum of five minutes and endeavour not to repeat anything from previous sessions or submissions. So, although that's a big enough challenge. Uh, we try and respect that uh, in full here and, and get right to the point. So um, from our perspective, uh, small businesses obviously need, need to adapt and, and change their behavior in order to help uh, reach any of the sort of net zero targets that, that may find their way to the floor and be passed. Um, small businesses consistently tell us they want to play their part. That's a given by now. And so we, as FSB, fully support the, the need to act on climate change, and, and we've increasingly engaged on the issue proactively over the, the, the last number of years. Recently, we conducted research and last week released a, an FSB report in this exact area. Uh, and so we know um, what small businesses think, what they're experiencing, what they need, and we've made a, a series of recommendations accordingly. Um, FSB itself is, we think, in a key position to help ensure that F SMEs make the changes that they need to successfully. Uh, and so we're really trying to work collaboratively uh, and positively uh, with colleagues, members, policymakers to ensure that SMEs can understand and then obviously contribute to uh, and potentially in some cases benefit from uh, the opportunities that come with uh, either NI or, let's say, the UK's uh, overall transition uh, towards net zero. But at the moment, uh, despite, despite a plethora of strategies, uh, one of which you were just discussing there, uh, the latest environment uh, strategy, uh, and some good engagement, there's still a real patchwork effect uh, on environmental policy here in NI, I'm, I'm sure members will agree. Uh, and that's really concerning for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and this is why we've engaged with and, and particularly responded to, to both the, the climate change bills with the simple aim of uh, ensuring uh, the small and micro business impact test or SAMBIT is integrated into the legislation by uh, way of amendment. So members will be aware that in September, we give a, a comprehensive overview of SAMBIT, including suggested amendments. And this is our primary recommendation for this bill as well. Uh, we sent our proposed uh, amendments for this bill to the committee in our consultation response at the end of September. So I'm not gonna go into the detail uh, at this stage, given the sort of parameters here. Um, however, as a very quick recap, um, we, we referenced uh, Scotland and Fiji in our, our last evidence session, uh, and today it's England, uh, where they use SAMBA in their policy development process. So SAMBA stands for the Small uh, and Micro Business Impact Assessment. And in practice, what this means is that officials tasked with, say, let's say developing uh, a new climate action plan or, or, or strategy would engage with uh, small and micro businesses as part of any process. 
they carry out an impact assessment of the potential plans or ideas, what they think may or may not happen, uh, and then they'll publish that as part of uh, any consultation. And it's that simple. Um, it's not designed to alter the outcome or the target uh, in particular, but it's really there to ensure that there's a mandatory and an effective form of engagement and thinking, uh, and that that takes place and then maximizes the chances of good policy coming out the other end. Um, it's an approach that's used uh, not only in uh, countries sort of surrounding us here, but it's all, all around the world. Um, so we would really call on members of the committee to help ensure that, uh, um, in addition to maximizing the level of uh, environmental policy development through um, the Samba Amendment, it's it's key, but it's, it's there. In this bill, um, although it takes a, a different approach, the same principle uh, of engagement applies. Uh, and, and of course, depending on what comments or questions arise today, we'll, we'll follow up the committee in writing, uh, addressing uh, any targeted points, I'm just particularly conscious of time. So just very quickly, in conclusion, uh, as outlined in our written and, and, and oral evidence um, to date, FSB simply aims to ensure that, that the legislation and, and future policy development in particular is fit for purpose. We ensure that whatever it's called, a climate action plan um, or equivalent helps to engage, enable and encourage uh, small businesses to play their part in the journey towards net zero. And we think, crucially, the final point, if these amendments or something to this effect uh, are not um, made, we, we feel it's a duty to note to, the, to members that there really is an increased risk of the legislation and future policy being unfit for purpose and the associated uh, negative ramifications there. So stop there. Thank you for listening. I uh, hope to take some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil, we're going to move over now to Ray. Hi. Um, I was going to hand over to Tim. Actually, Tim was going to lead all this bit. Yeah. Oh, whichever suits. Yep. Okay. Hi. Welcome, members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present again. As you know, we presented on the last climate change bill. And just by way of background, as some of you may know, the Charter Institute of Waste Management is the leading professional body for resources and waste management sector. So there's about 6,000 individuals across the UK and Ireland, uh, and we've been around for over 100 years. Basically, in regard, regards to waste management, the big thing which has received a lot of airplay in recent COP26 has been methane. And uh, the amount of methane that's produced is, is a real concern for us as a sector it's largely from landfill, it's largely from biogenic sources, that's paper, that's card, that's timber. And the big issue for us is how can we work with the supply chains uh, to make sure that waste, is di uh, waste of this nature is diverted and where can it be diverted to? This is one of the real key challenges uh, and certainly for the UK for, for, for how to move waste, these kind of wastes away from landfill. Um, it has a huge global warming potential, which is 85 times greater than carbon dioxide. Um, and, and that is something which is obviously crucial to, to mitigate or, or minimize. And in Northern Ireland, we're showing that the greenhouse gas statistics show that we're, we're generating something close to uh, 0.7 million tonnes uh, of carbon dioxide, of carbon dioxide equivalent from the waste sector uh, from in Northern Ireland. So this is a, a key area where we can make a quick win. Uh, we said previously that methane emissions from landfill, both operational and closed, need to be brought under control. And there's various ways you can do that through retrospective uh, installation of landfill wells and stuff. But it's very awkward. And the easiest thing to do is turn off the tap at source. Do not allow these materials to get into uh, the, the landfill waste stream from the, from the outset. And uh, this is what, what we saw was the COP26 world leaders pledging to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Um, as I said, it's from anaerobic di de the, the anaerobic di decomposition of biogenic wood type materials in landfill. Uh, the landfill capture rates are uh, uh, a certain level of, of efficiency, but the sixth carbon budget produced by the CCC showed that really uh, we need to increase the capture from landfill size up, eight, up to 80% by 2050 and reduce emissions uh, quite significantly from this source. And obviously the two principal ways are to ban biogenic waste to landfill and to capture and utilize more from the methane that is produced, which for, can then be, be directly injected into the gas grid with a bit of, collect, with a bit of cleaning or uh, used to generate electrical en en um, energy. 
in relation to carbon dioxide, which is obviously one of the key sources of the key areas of work in uh, focusing on the climate bill. Our big emissions come in many regards from logistics and treatment. Uh, the average bin lorry generates quite a substantial, uh, well, uses quite a substantial uh, amount of fuel in driving around the place. Um, that tends to be captured as part of transport. And much of the waste sector is actually embedded in the other sectors. Uh, and, and some of the work that's just been said uh, by Neil there on Samba is a classic example. We're seeing some shift under the Environment Bill to how should councils provide a better service of collection on a micro or medium-sized scale to local businesses. And there's discussions underway at the minute through the EPR legislation, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, across Northern Ireland, in terms of uh, transport emissions from waste, we're generating something in the region of 150,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that's quite substantial. And obviously, as we move forward into the circular economy, resource efficiency becomes a key thing, a key aspect. And the idea would be, as per the methane, waste must be moved up the waste hierarchy. And we need to valorize wherever possible that waste that is discarded, the residual waste, as much as possible to reduce CO2 emissions. And if that was fully done by moving waste up, uh, by ad adopting resource efficiency throughout the, the value chain, moving waste up the hierarchy and valorizing uh, residual waste, that we could reduce CO2 emissions by something in the order of 39% from a recent circular economy report from the Netherlands. Um, and finally, the, the main issue for us is, is largely, as I commented, about waste transport emissions. There are significant emissions from RCVs. Diesel-powered RCVs generate uh, a sizable footprint. There's a lot of them out there. And if we're going to look at other alternative sources of fuel, like electrical powertrains, that's going to be expensive. And there has to be a recognition in the mix that if we're moving down that road, when we move down that road towards hybrid stroke electric stroke hydrogen fuel RCVs, there's a significant cost to be paid, much of which is in, in the public sector, and just some consideration to how that could be funded or supported, because uh, everything in the public sector comes at a cost which uh, it, it is not directly attributable and recoverable from consumers, and so there needs to be some recognition, some discussion from this from this uh, committee to other committees to see where those sources of funding could be gained from to, to spur that development. And there have been some very welcome developments around things like the electric buses recently. There's also how you can use the likes of CO2, uh, carbon dioxide and uh, methane using uh, advanced, uh, advanced, um, advanced chemical processes to generate hydrogen, to produce the likes of green hydrogen. And there's work underway to see how that can be, can be progressed uh, in a number of universities. Um, I'm going to stop there, uh, bar from to say that in Northern Ireland, regarding waste management, we have a lack of infrastructure. There's a lack of infrastructure required to meet recycling requirements. There's a lack of infrastructure to deal with residual waste requirements. And there's a lack of, a lack of infrastructure to deal with some of these AD and in-vessel composting type arrangements that are coming down the pipeline towards us. We have a fundamental lack of infrastructure. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, OK, we ask uh, Anika. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for inviting us to Wildlife today. I will also do my best to keep this to five minutes and avoid repeating anything that's been said before. Um, so my focus will be on nature-based solutions, and I do know that you've had other presentations to the committee on this theme, but I'll try and put a slightly different spin on it. Um, so nature-based solutions are something that can provide a really significant contribution to emissions reductions and to reaching any targets that are set in the bill. And they can also have the added benefit of reducing risk from climate change related extreme weather events such as flooding, coastal erosion, heat waves and wildfire risk. And this is well recognised in the UK Climate Change Committee's recommendations in terms of how nature-based solutions should be used. And actually having heard a little bit of the discussion on the environment strategy, those targets and those recommendations are exactly what we want to see implemented in Northern Ireland. But to make the most of nature-based solutions, we really do need a sound platform within the legislation, which can then facilitate the necessary action. So as such, we would propose a nature-based solutions amendment 
amendment to the bill. And we echo what our colleagues in RSPB Northern Ireland have recommended to the committee in terms of the potential clause wording options. And these draw on similar clauses in the Scottish Climate Act and the Republic of Ireland's Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Amendment Act 2021. So this really seeks to put a legislative framework in place that supports nature-based projects that seek to reduce or increase the removal of greenhouse gas emissions and to support climate resilience. And that's really important. So it's both the mitigation and the adaptation message for nature-based solutions. Furthermore, we want to see those being able to enhance biodiversity and tackle the biodiversity crisis. And we believe that well-designed nature-based solutions can do exactly that. Today, I want to quickly highlight a couple of examples, including a lesser known nature-based solution, blue carbon. As a marine biologist, this is a pet favorite of mine, and I want to highlight the role of the oceans that's so often forgotten. So the ocean is capable of taking care of an estimated fifth of the carbon that we need to tackle to achieve the global emissions reductions in line with the Paris Agreement. Already globally, the ocean has absorbed 90% of the energy caused by greenhouse gas emissions. So that's really minimized the temperature rises that the globe is experiencing. Annually, the oceans absorb around a third of human related carbon dioxide emissions. But to continue to have this capacity, they need to be kept healthy and certain habitats must be protected and restored as they play a significant role in locking away carbon. These habitats are known as blue carbon. Locally, we have a range of blue carbon habitats. Around our coasts, habitats such as salt marsh, seagrass and shellfish reefs play a really vital role, not only in locking away carbon, but also in protecting our coastlines from sea level rise related storms related from climate change, flooding and erosion, and they also maintain and improve water quality, as well as being vital for biodiversity. A great example that came up just yesterday on how managing these habitats can have multiple benefits is the salt marsh restoration work that's being undertaken in the Thames estuary. So part of the Thames estuary was declared a dead zone in 1957, but is now beginning to thrive, including the return of seahorses as a result of active habitat protection and restoration. In Northern Ireland, more than half of our estimated current extent of coastal blue carbon habitats occurs within our marine protected area network. This means that there's a huge opportunity to effectively protect these carbon sinks if management is put in place for this. There's also potential to triple the estimated blue carbon sequestration rate of our MPA network through active habitat restoration and recreation. Before I move on to my next nature-based solution example, I want to emphasize that there is a great range of nature-based solutions available to us. We all know quite a bit about planting forests, woodlands, trees and hedgerows, and we've also heard about um, how we manage soils for carbon, and I know that's a particularly important for the Agriculture Committee. Furthermore, species-rich grasslands, which we have in abundance in Northern Ireland, are also vital as carbon um, measures for locking away carbon. However, all the protection, restoration and management of these must be deployed at scale and they all require long term significant investment in order to yield the maximum benefits as a climate action, but also as a biodiversity action. They can also be deploy deployed in urban as well as rural environments. So nature based solutions is not just a countryside issue or an ocean issue. It's also in how we plan our cities and put in green infrastructure, for example, to minimize the impacts of flooding. My final example is fairly well known to the committee and again was mentioned under the discussion with the environment strategy, which is the role of peatlands. In Northern Ireland, there's already around 45 years worth of our current annual greenhouse gas emissions locked away in peat. Healthy peatlands are absolutely crucial to the ability of our land to sequester and store carbon. But as the committee is probably well aware, around 80% of our peatlands are degraded and are currently emitting 6% of total Northern Ireland greenhouse gas emissions annually. If those degraded peatlands can be restored, this is a huge opportunity to reduce our emissions and actually start to lock away carbon. 
We are currently involved in a project in partnership with DERA to map the peak depth and condition across Northern Ireland to help target effective restoration and really ramp up that restoration effort. There's been a lot of successful partnership working in Northern Ireland and cross-border projects that have delivered really successful peatland restoration. So we've learned how to do this. We know how to restore peatlands, but we now need this to be accelerated and deployed at scale. And crucially, we have to work with the landowners because peatland is on private property in the large part. So this needs to go hand in hand with land use approaches and as with many nature-based solutions, it can be enabled through future agri-environment schemes. So to summarise, we very much strongly advocate for a sound legislative platform to make the most of nature-based solutions and there's an opportunity through the Climate Change Bill to do this. <laughs> And we believe that this is the right time to do it. And it will also support the green growth strategy in terms of creating jobs and developing skills that can be deployed across Northern Ireland in both rural and urban environments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Annika. Uh, can I ask uh, now Nicola Hughes from Stimina NA to uh, present? Well, good morning. Thanks, Chair. Um, good morning, Nicola. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, so our unique perspective, I guess, is sustainable development, and we've anal analysed the bill through that lens. And sustainability is all about taking a long-term holistic approach, so obviously balancing economic, social and environmental needs, and needs. But it's all about how can we thrive, this generation without compromising future generations' ability to thrive. And the golden rules are that we need to put economic, um, or sorry, environmental and social needs on a par with economic needs. And also we need to put um, the needs of future generations on a par with the needs of our generation. So that's kind of what it's centred on. Um, so overall, we're kind of looking at this at a very high level um, and we, uh, we're extremely concerned that um, that there may in fact be no bill passed um, uh, and we'd really like to see the amalgamation of climate change num uh, bill number one and number two into a single comprehensive bill underpinned by an ambitious net zero target. Um, if we don't do that, it would be a major failure of this government. So I've compared this bill I kind of against a, a strong net zero bill um, and looked at it in terms of um, sustainability. Um, and we think that the number two bill is actually not in the best interest of society, not in the best interest of the environment. And contrary to what the movers of the bill are saying, it is not in the best interest of the economy long term, long term being the uh, key word there. Um, so we're concerned that the bill underestimates the level of risk that climate change presents. And um, so this week, Sir Patrick Valance, the, the government's chief scientific uh, advisor, said that climate change is a much bigger and potentially deadlier problem than COVID-19. More people will die from climate change than, than coronavirus if we fail to act. And uh, just yesterday, Mary Robinson said at COP26 that the governments that are not setting a net zero target by 2050 are not in crisis mode. In other words, they're not viewing this climate change as a crisis. So we'd encourage policymakers to look at the whole of the economy, not just individual sectors. While some sectors might require tough measures, net zero will deliver a boost to the economy overall. That's what the Committee on Climate Change have said. Um, and policymakers need to look at the big, big picture and take a long-term approach. So think of it as an investment. Um, we'd remind government that their primary duty is to protect citizens, not grow the economy at all costs. Um, yeah, and so I, just a few uh, things that we'd like to see strengthened in the bill, if I may. So we'd like to see, obviously, a net zero target for greenhouse gas emissions, preferably by 2045 or earlier, but no later than 2050. Um, there needs to be a requirement for an overarching climate action plan, but also carbon budgets for all sectors, so sectoral targets to make sure that there isn't just a dash for carbon and that some sectors are given a free pass while others have to pick up the burden, um, so to make sure there's a fairness in how it's administered. Um, we think there needs to be a mechanism for independent scrutiny so that um, the government isn't just assessing performance um, itself and through some sort of independent uh, commissioner or climate office or equivalent. Um, there's no mention of a just transition or just transition principles in the bill, so there needs to be provision for, for that to guide the way sectors move to net zero. Um, there needs, so we, we're really pleased to see that there's the introduction of a climate change duty and public authorities, but we'd like it to be equivalent to the, Scot the Scottish Climate Change Act. 
um, uh, and we could strengthen it by including adaptation in the reporting requirement on public bodies, because at the minute uh, there's just no requirement for public bodies or councils to report on climate change adaptation. Um, we think we need a dedicated minister and a new department for climate and energy transition to ensure co effective coordination across government and some sort of delivery body to oversee and support the climate and energy transition and annual statistics at the very least on Northern Ireland's overseas consumption carbon footprint. Um, and yeah, just overall, just to closing remarks, um, we think the economic argument for the 82% target is challengeable. So uh, the Committee on Climate Change say that the cost of the 82% cut will be less than 1% of GDP per year, um, net zero slightly more, but there will be a net boost overall through operational savings. Um, conversely, we know from the Stern report that the cost of climate change will cost us 5% of GDP per year every year. Um, but we haven't seen the economic analysis of the costs and benefits to the Northern Irish economy of uh, net zero versus 82% versus doing nothing and the impacts of climate change. So really, we think it would be um, prudent for the government to commission um, an independent economic study to give policymakers the confidence that they need to move forward with the net zero target. Um, secondly, we're worried that this 82% target, because it's going to be seen as a weak climate change bill, it might actually restrict the growth of the green economy in Northern Ireland, because currently businesses are operating to the net zero UK target. Um, and this bill will actually weaken um, the ambition in, in the private sector and investors in re renewables might get cold feet about investing uh, in Northern Ireland because of a perceived lack of government commitment. And finally, I think um, there's, a, there's, there's a lack of public support. I think overall the public wants stronger action on climate change. And um, so there was a recent poll by Cantar Public that said that 76% of people would accept stricter environmental rules and regulations. Um, we all know that when change is proposed, it's often the minority that shout the loudest. And those with a vested interest in maintaining the, the status quo often get into the ears of politicians. If this bill is passed, it will almost certainly need to be amended to net zero due to grow, growing public demand. And we've seen the Republic of Ireland's bill and the UK government bill had to be amended to net zero and um, having previously set weaker targets. Um, and in conclusion, it just really comes down to risk management or risk mismanagement. So um, if climate change is the biggest economic risk in the world right now, why are we not throwing everything at it to, to, to stop this problem? Um, so I was trying to think of a good analogy, you know, where risk is badly managed um, or where, where, where people perceive a threat to be smaller than it actually is. So imagine the scenario where your house is burning down and you run into your house to get your suitcase under the bed with all your life savings, even though everyone's telling you not to run in and get it, but you think it'll be okay. Um, it's worth getting it. Um, so you've assessed the risk to be actually lower than it is. It's reckless, it's greedy, it's selfish, and it's short-sighted. And I think it's better to be cautious um, when there's so much on the line. So that's it. Uh, happy to take any questions after. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nicola. And indeed, thank you to all the contributors. Um, I'm just going to move straight around for questions. And the first person I've down is Harry. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Much appreciated. And thank you as all for attending. First question is directed towards Neil on the FSB there. So, Neil, maybe you could tell me <clears throat> how much of an impact on small businesses would number one bill make compared to number two? And could you manage this impact? Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, to the member. Um, so the, the thing about about both bills is that, and it was referenced by Nicola, is that we haven't seen an independent economic uh, analysis a, across the piece here. And I think it's a really good point. It's it's very difficult to perceive the impact from a small business perspective whenever we're talking at such a, a high legislative stage. And there is, let's say, it's not an area we're experts in, um, climate that is, we're experts in business, but whenever there's disagreement on evidence from committees uh, and various stakeholders, 
it can be quite confusing from a small business perspective. And so that's the number one reason we would advocate, yes, for economic and independent impact assessments, but also that's the reason um, we've proposed the SAMBIT amendments, because whatever way this gets passed, it's likely to be a political decision, let's say. Um, it's going to be officials that then sit down and, and work out how we're going to get to whatever target we set. And so it's really important from that perspective that uh, the engagement is effective and that the proper analysis is done at that point. Yeah, and basically, I mean, the idea would be to preserve all small businesses, Neil, while helping them achieve new targets. This is what you're aiming for, isn't that right? Well, that would, that would be that would be lovely to uh, protect small businesses and, and, and get to where we need to get to. I, I think it's worth reiterating that, and I don't think I said this in, in my first piece, that it's really mm -hmm. essential that we do get legislation passed here. Uh, you know, that that's key. Um, and there will be small businesses that, that spawn out of uh, the, the green growth side, let's say, of, of, of the journey towards net zero. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, and I think it's... It's delicate in many ways. Um, we're, we're speaking on behalf of small businesses and um, we think that the more that we can engage uh, and talk through the detail and, and use independent scrutiny and analysis, the higher the chance that whatever uh, we decide to do is going to be fit for purpose. There's a distinct, let's say, lack of that independent scrutiny and um, assessment from our perspective. Yep, that's okay. Thank you. And um, another wee question, just chair to Nicola in Sustainable AI. Uh, Nicola, to achieve what you want to achieve in relation to climate action and the time you wish to achieve it would represent major hardship for those reliant on the agri food sector for their livelihoods here in Northern Ireland. I'm just wondering what support would you propose be given to those who would face hardship or lose their livelihoods? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's it's hard to you need we need to put figures. So where is the the modelling on the agricultural sector that shows what the alternative look, looks like? So at the moment we have um, industrial agriculture and we need to move to sustainable agriculture. But no one has. It's it's hard to describe that what that looks like and how that can be profitable, without actually doing it, showing it that it's possible. Reducing, we need to reduce our livestock numbers. Livestock numbers, um, but if there is a way for farmers to prosper through paying them for um, conservation measures, but also giving them a fair price for their products, and through some sort of more regulation on the export market, on on the, the exporters, that they pass more of the profit on to producers. So if you said to a farmer, look, you need to reduce your herd size by fifty percent, but you'll get the same amount of money for that through an alternative sustainable pathway, of course they would say that's fine, we'll sign up to that. The main thing is um, making sure that, um, I think it's, it's unfair to say that this is going to be financial hardship without um, doing the assessments and the modelling on what an alternative pathway looks like. Um, I always say that can't or can't do is an attitude, it's a state of mind. There's always an alternative and there's a kind of Darwinian theory, you know, you adapt to survive, you adapt and thrive. So there's going to be an immense environmental um, pressure put on farmers through climate change. Ironically, they're at the front line and they're going to have to adapt to new seasonal weather patterns, um, uh, drier summers, wetter uh, winters and springs. There's going to be a squeeze on fodder production, uh, livestock numbers in general. So you know, they have to adapt anyway. The system is, the agri-food system is kind of broken uh, anyway in terms it's not financially sustainable and everyone knows that. So let's paint a picture of what an alternative looks like. Let's put some economic figures on that, on what the opportunity is, um, instead of going down the narrative that it's going to be all negative. Okay. Um, just did another wee line out of it. And... Um... Being a responsible global citizen involves eating less red meat and dairy. So like a logical conclusion from this statement, is it an individual who eats meat, meat and dairy is not a responsible citizen? Is that not a bit strong? Um, so no one, uh, it's like, yeah, I mean, 
being a responsible global citizen is thinking about the whole, not your individual, so not putting yourself first. Mm -hmm. So like in that example of running into a burning house, you think of your family, you don't just think of yourself. So if everyone in the world, and I'm, I'm a, I consume meat, but I, I try and eat it only every other day. That's mm -hmm. because I feel if everyone in the world ate meat the way I did, uh, loads, millions of people would go hungry because it's the least sustainable way of feeding people. So it's unfair. Um, so there's a moral and ethical argument that is unfair, but no one is going to put that. That's on individuals to choose. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we can control that. Young, you know, there's a trend. Younger people are more... Um, aware of that kind of injustice in the world and sharing out our resources and they're stepping up uh, basically and they're going, moving towards more plant-based diets. Um, so no one's going to force anyone to do it, but it is, you know, it's just one thing that we can all do. Um, doesn't mean we all have to become vegetarian and vegan, just, just use resources a bit more sensibly. Yep. Thank you very much for your answers, Nicola. And thank you also, Neil, and that'll do me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. William? William? Um, okay. Sorry, well, well. Ask him to unmute, Chair. Uh, sorry, William, can you unmute there? Can you? William? I've got it now, okay. Yeah, yeah we can hear you now, Mum. Okay, thank you. Mummy, first question to Neil is uh, Neil, um, can thank you for all of your presentations. In relation to Sandbot uh, uh, and the Sandbot Amendment in, in both bills, I think you request or want to see, is there any other region in the UK or any other bills that have Sandbot in, included in them? Yeah, so it's sli slightly different. Um, in, in other parts of the UK, uh, Samba, uh, let's call it in England, is, is, is not directly related to the, the climate change uh, legislation in place there. It's something that's done across all uh, policy making uh, in various departments. So that's, we would see that as a really good thing. Uh, and so because it's just best practice here, um, it's best practice in all departments in NI, it's really dependent on perhaps the official uh, or the team or, you know, the, I don't know, whatever way the wind's blowing, let's say, it, it's, it's very dependent and perhaps a little inconsistent. Um, and so they don't need SAMBA integrated into legislation in other parts because it's by default the way they, they do things. So in answer to your question, no. Um, and hopefully that outlines the reason why as well. Okay, thank you. Um, to Nicola, uh, Nicola, um, you don't agree with the target of 82% by 2050. Uh, do you accept the Climate Changes Committee's recommendation in the, in the fact that Northern Ireland is a food producing region that feeds 10 or 15 million uh, in the mainland UK. Therefore, by reaching their recommendation is to go forward than 82% would seriously damage the agri food sector. Given that we produce so much food for the mainland, we actually by reaching 82% ensures that the whole of the UK actually did reach net zero. So Northern Ireland being part of the UK actually reaches net zero by 2050 uh, as, as being part of the UK. Would you accept that? Um, I just think, um, it, it's, I think it comes down to what is a fair share contribution. So if you're only looking at it as what is our fair share as a region of the UK, then that's fine. You're, you're looking at it as a, con as a contribution to the UK. But if we uh, have the competency to set our own targets that we therefore are treating ourselves as a country, um, 82% reduction by 2050 is not a fair share of the global carbon reduction um, burden. So if every country copied Northern Ireland, we would we would be, be on two, more than two degrees Celsius of warming. We would not be aligned to the Paris Agreement. So that's what I mean. This is not, it's not actually a science-based target, meaning um, we're not, you know, we're not, uh, 
on a par with the Paris, the UN Paris Agreement. So it depends if you're treating Northern Ireland only in the context of the UK as a kind of a not a not a real um, not a, not a global economy. Not we're treating it as a region, um, or are we treating it as a country, a part of the world? Um, and showing leadership to other countries, because if everyone followed us in setting an 82% a week target, um, it's game over, global disaster. So there's a, I think it's a, it's a principle, the principle of the thing. And the other issue I have with the modelling is that this recommendation by the CCC um, did a variety of different scenarios. But, you know, they choose which parameters, which policy parameters go into the model models. So um, the option of, say, for example, going beyond a 50% cut in livestock numbers is more or less off the table. It's just about in there. So there, you construe or constrain the scenarios based on the, the, the parameters. Politicians choose the parameters. So this is all about choice. We don't have to produce food, food for 9 million people. We don't have to do that. That's something that the government has encouraged over years and years, but we don't have to do that. Um, meat and dairy is not a staple diet. It's not, it's a luxury part of our diet. It's not core food. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I have a problem with that. Basically that it's not a, it's, we're not doing our fair share. Um, and ultimately climate change is a global issue. It's not a UK issue. It's not a, only a local issue. It's a global issue. So everybody, every country has to work together. And if we don't work together and if we don't align our ambition, we're, we're never going to make any progress. Uh, but surely there is a danger in what you say. We produce ten, enough food for 10 million people in the UK or 15 million people. You just export that to some other country that, that creates much more in relation to emissions than we do. We do, given some of the other countries like Argentina and Brazil, some of them are cutting down rainforests to produce more food to export. I mean, we are part, whether we like it or not, we are a region in the UK, and for me, it seems a, a very sensible attitude to take. As a, all the regions of the UK followed the Climate Change Committee's recommendations. Uh, yeah. Why should we not? Well, I, I can give an analogy. Like, um, so this is a more extreme analogy, but um, just because China, there's a demand for ivory in China, doesn't mean the African government should allow poaching. Do you see what I mean? Uh, the other, you know, just because there's a demand for opium doesn't mean Northern Ireland should start producing opium. Like, I'm not saying it's the same thing. Meat and dairy is no. a luxury item and we need to reduce it. But we don't need to, we need to pay our own farmers, feed our own people, encourage shorter food supply chains. And um, there's, there's an undeniable, um, this is ultimately this export model has all been about growth, 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 but Northern Ireland has, t there's been a huge environmental toll in Northern Ireland. In, so we shouldn't really be that proud of this. Ten, we feed 10 million people. Uh, it's not actually a good thing because there's a, a, a huge ammonia crisis. All of our lakes are polluted. Um, there's major, major problems um, for the local people of Northern Ireland. So from a social and environmental point of view, it's really, okay. really concerning. So it's kind of Northern Ireland is kind of the dirty corner of, of the UK. So it's not a good thing. Um, and it's all been for growth. Um, and the majority of the wealth that's been created from this model has gone to the agri-food uh, processors and exporters and farmers are hanging on by a thread in terms of the, the, po the money in their pockets. So there needs to be a more, a better distribution of the wealth created. And um, we, we're not calling on, you know, don't mm -hmm. decimate the economy, but kind of rein it in and bring it in, on, bring, regulate it a bit more um, and find better ways of, of rewarding farmers. Uh, I'll say this in finishing, like we produce uh, as I said, a, a sizable amount of food. It's exported to the UK mainland, which is very close. Carbon miles to import it from other countries is a much more environmental issue than than, a, than exporting a few miles across the sea to the UK. I think it is it is a mistake to export that to another country across Europe or maybe further afield. Uh, when we can reach net zero as a region of the UK. So this is my, it, it makes no sense. There's 100,000 jobs in Northern Ireland. Uh, 
dependent on the agri-food sector. So, you know, you, to be cutting that sector by 50%, there will be a massive job losses. There will be big issues in Northern Ireland if that happens. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, William. Um, okay, John? Chair, sure, thank you. Can I thank the panellists as well? I have two questions, uh, Chair. The first one is this, and look, um, I'm going to start by being frank, and some of the questions and, and some of the conversation I have heard before, and I'm sure colleagues uh, will, will feel the same. So I'm going to try, if I may, to take a slightly different slant and ask this. There's an understandable fixation with dates and years in respect of targets, and we know that short, sharp messaging makes headlines and, and gets attention quicker than longer, more detailed conversations. But to, to try and um, bring uh, prioritisation to it, can I ask, and I don't mind which member of the panellists takes this question, can I ask if the panellists in, in general agree that whatever the date, and every day we spend talking about that date as another day with no legislative framework towards that date, uh, whatever the date, whatever the target, most effort will have to be made in the next few years. So whether the target is 2030, 2040, 2050 or beyond, most effort will be required from 2021 onwards in order to halt yeah. the serious slide that we're already on. With the general agreement there in terms of prioritisation uh, of action rather than eventual date should, should be the issue. Okay. Any, any member of the panel want to take it? I will just say that uh, from, from our point of view, it's, it's really sort of the time to, it is now to stop talking and start doing. Um, we really need to get on with this now, as, as John says, it's, it's becoming uh, one minute before midnight almost. Um, it's time to get on with it. Um, yeah, I would echo exactly what Ray said. You know, the concern is that we still don't have an act in legislation and that without that all the subsequent sector plans and policies can't flow so until we have an act in place that's going to impede what we can do we also need to plan budgets over the next few years and we can't do any of that without this in legislation and i very much agree with your comments john about the need to fast track action now um, and also many of these solutions won't come to full fruition for at least a decade or two so if we don't invest now, we will then suffer the consequences of not having done so in, in a you know, far worse capacity. Um, so I think it's trying to front load the action is absolutely vital, but we recognize we can't do that without legislation. So in some ways getting caught between you know, the different targets and 2045 or 2050 is actually just delaying getting this in place. And I think nearly everybody, you know, certainly Ulster Wildlife is part of the Climate Coalition, um, as are many other environmental NGOs, such as the National Trust and Woodland Trust and RSPB. And we all agree that by far the most important thing is just getting a Climate Change Act. Um, so that's certainly, I would very much echo that that is the priority rather than the sort of toing and froing between the resulting emissions targets. Chair, I'm grateful for those responses in, in relation to perhaps refocusing efforts here. Uh, the, the second question is m more uh, directed, I think, at the Chair Institute for Waste Management. Can I ask, there's been much talk today and on previous occasions about um, the waste issue and recycling and circular economy and, and relating all of that to, to green energy and, and better outcomes. Can I ask a very direct question? To what extent has the abject failure to, to deliver on consistency of recycling across Northern Ireland contributed to the current crisis? And how soon can we start to deal with that at regional and local level? Tim, do you want to say that one? Sorry, buddy. Do you want to go first? Yeah. No, no, you go. <laughs> it's a local issue. <laughs> you, you're more experienced on that one. <laughs> uh, thanks. John, I, I welcome your recognition that there is a crisis, and uh, I, I think that's really important to state. Waste tends to get overlooked in many of these conversations because it's the back end of all these processes upstream. And as such, we're very much the Cinderella sector and have been for years. Uh, the issue for me, as you know, 
is we, we don't have uh, enough infrastructure to deal with the amount of material that we're generating in Northern Ireland. You're talking about the interface between the consumer and the treatment technologies and the way it's collected. There's a lot of conversation going on, a lot of discussion going on nationally about what is the best way to collect that. Um, I think we risk running down a rabbit hole by focusing merely on the collection element. Uh, collection is important. Councils are doing much to discuss and debate uh, how to collect, what to collect, when to collect. Uh, it's a very active conversation with the department at the minute. I think the department could be clearer as to what it's actually seeking to achieve and how that could contribute directly to the circular economy. It tends to be more, um, it tends to be more suggestive than directive as to what needs to be done. And it also needs to recognize that if it is going to ask for significant change, if it is seeking significant change, as I mentioned in my comments earlier on, it needs to put money where its mouth is to pay for some of this change. The one thing that Ray said earlier on, which was really, really strongly reflected at a, at a conference that we held last month, was the desire for this sector to actively step up and drive the agenda is legion. The whole sector wants to do more. And I'm afraid, as has been said by a few of the speakers here, and as has been so well, so, so well articulated by Greta Thunberg, we as a sector are hearing far too much blah, blah, blah. We need action. Much of what's coming down the pipeline may well be transitory while we move from where we are today to where we need to be in 20 years or 30 years time. But the long and short of it is there's far too much talk going on and far too little action being taken to pass legislation to enact things going forward. You're right, there does need to be an overhaul in terms of how we're doing things, but that needs done at pace. And instead we get endless equivocation and delay and we get review upon review, assessment upon assessment and nothing changes. And that is wrong. That's wrong for the people working in the sector. It's wrong for the environment. It's wrong across the piece. And all the time, things gradually deteriorate and degenerate until they happen faster. Kevin, can I appreciate your frankness on that? And, and, and would you agree, if I, if I can press this one just a little further, would you agree that the number of structures involved in delivery across Northern Ireland um, are, are a contributory factor to the delay and also, of course, by the very nature of having additional structures or, or, or numerous structures um, and additional drain on resources, financial and otherwise? John, I'm going to ask you to be more clear. When you say additional structures, which structures are you referring to specifically? Because there's not that many structures involved. Well, there, there, are a number, there are a number of agencies and waste management structures, and certainly for a population of size greater than you would find in other regions. We have the councils involved. There are two sub-regional groupings, uh, and then we have the department, and then we have the regulator. So uh, unless you're proposing something along the lines of what went on in, in, in Britain back in the 1990s, when waste collection authorities and waste disposal authorities were combined to create unitaries, uh, and then there was consideration given about whether that could be done at sub-regional level. That's one way of doing it. Now, we've never had that development in Northern Ireland. We've had more of a unitary-based structure uh, where that collection disposal authority has been combined at council level from the get-go. Alternatively, if you look at the Southern Irish model, where they're actually talking about having sub-regional groupings, which originally I think there were about six or seven, and they reverted to three, and they have now going down to one, I think, in the last year. But that has been solely around the messaging, and it has not controlled in any way the contracting or waste collection arrangements. So I think it needs clarity as to just what you're talking about. But ultimately as well, what, what would be the expected end game? Would it be a structure based on a Northern Ireland company, the likes of Water Service? Would it be something based on a joint committee with council ownership? How, how do you see this actually landing? Um, because at the minute, you know, it's fine to say there's too many structures. What I say is there's not too many structures. It's just the structures are not being given the impetus or the ability to perform to their optimum because we're stuck in a political hiatus. There's a lack mm -hmm. of decision making. And therefore, appreciate that, Tim. John, just, uh, before and, and in, just before you come in, I, I agree that either way it requires a legislative directive anyway to 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 um, bring the consistency. I think we think we reached agreement on that. 
Uh, I, I think we, we should just kind of keep the questions and answers interesting as this conversation is just strictly to claim it to Bill. Just in, in terms of that, John, I don't know if that's you finished or not. Yeah, that is, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary, you're next. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. As, um, my question regard is um, to Nicola. Nicola, I was I was a little concerned, sort of, at you referring to Northern Ireland as the dirty corner of the UK. Northern Ireland is a beautiful country. We have beautiful forests. We have beautiful lakes with beautiful rivers and indeed it's very popular as a tourist destination and i do feel do feel you do it a great injustice by referring to it as the dirty corner of the uk however one thing i would do want to say you spoke that this 82 percent may restrict growth of businesses in northern ireland and um, that has been stated in the climate climate change bill uh, that we're discussing at at the moment, that, this eighty two percent. Now, it does not say eighty two percent. Eighty two percent or better. I think you've got to understand. So there's a chance that we may we may even be better than the eighty two percent. But can you give me an idea as to how it will restrict the growth of businesses in Northern Ireland, given that? given that we're going to perhaps have issues regarding our agricultural economy and the loss of jobs there, the reduction, the reduction of animals, et cetera, in Northern Ireland. Uh, thank you, Rosemary. Um, so in regard to business, it's, um, it's the, the likes, not all businesses, so it's the likes of uh, the renewable energy industry, for example, um, and so, for example, there's big companies like Causeway Energy who are really interested in geothermal um, energy production um, and have eyed Northern Ireland as a, as a big opportunity. Also, offshore wind. Northern Ireland has a tremendous opportunity there for offshore wind when we get the policy um, in place for it. Um, so that is there's a major opportunity for investment for Northern Ireland and it'll help solve some of our energy fuel poverty issues um, and just generally in terms of our huge manufacturing base um, you know we've we've produced the parts for wind turbines that has reduced but it, so it's about investors having the confidence that this government is completely committed to a net zero um, target that will give them that, the confidence to invest in these burgeoning zero carbon, low carbon economy industries, um, which could, this is the whole point about the Committee on Climate Change's advice on the economics of this, is that whilst there may be some short term uh, sacrifices or indeed long term sacrifices is in some sector, some sectors, overall there will be a net boost by 2050, there'll be a net gain um, by, um, transitioning uh, to a, a zero carbon economy so we have to keep the long-term prize in mind rather than focusing on smaller sectors and in terms of um the dirty corner sorry i, I appreciate that's maybe a bit extreme uh, language but when I mean, you look at the figures and you look at the environmental indicators and um, so if you look at carbon we have the highest per capita carbon emissions in the uk at 11.2 tons of co2 per head of population so they're hugely carbon intensive and that's because of our land use the way we use our land land use change we're the least wooded part of the uh, europe and um, we've kind of we a couple of hundred of years ago we would have been there would have been woodland everywhere there would have been biodiversity deers and um, boars etc etc so that's all gone and there's essentially a monoculture of grass very little biodiversity very little forests and um, we have 14 percent um Ammonia, um, produ we produce 14% of the UK's ammonia, even though we only have something like two or 3% of the population. And ammonia is a, a invisible poisonous gas. Um, and uh, we also only one out of our 20 major lakes are in good condition. So 19 of our lakes are in either poor uh, or very poor condition. So that's just a few of the statistics. So it, it might look green, but actually relative to the rest of the UK, relative to the rest of the world, we're not statistically as green as we might think. Yeah, okay. It's, 
I find it, you no, know, you may produce those statistics, but I, do, I would invite you to come to Fermanagh any, any weekend and sample our, sample our countryside there, yes. Sample our countryside there. In, in relation to, I want to move on just to infrastructure. As you know, in the West, this is where we get the, we have a greater, uh, we have a greater degree of wind here or higher winds here in the West. And yet in our efforts to produce, to produce our electricity, our infrastructure is not able to cope with this. What, uh, there is a problem there. We, we, we've been concentrating on agriculture, but I think we need to look at other infrastructures that are not up to, up to speed either. And this is an opportunity we're missing in relation to uh, producing electricity. Is that for me or? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I would agree with your comments. Um, we need to uh, we need um, strong policy and legislation to put to uh, see strong investment in infrastructure, whether it's um, in decarbonisation of the grid, which generally would be really good for society, um, but also decarbonising our transport uh, sector, which will be uh, brilliant in terms of helping um, public health through cleaner air. So we're well behind on EV infrastructure, for example, public infrastructure for EV chargers. Um, and that all needs, as t I agree with Tim, we need rapid, rapid change on the low hanging fruit where there's a win, win, win for economy, society and planet. Uh, we need to just get on and do the things that make sense. And these are investments in our future. Um, and generally, you'll always find there's positive, uh, what we call co-benefits um, in terms of tackling things like fuel poverty, uh, cleaning the air, um, just giving people a better standard of life. And unfortunately, the agriculture, which is what you would call a hard to abate sector, it's a difficult to treat sector, it kind of dominates the debate. And it's a distraction, actually, because the majority of our Greenhouse gas emissions are from carbon dioxide, um, which is more of a problem than methane. And uh, there's so much we can do to start bringing that down. So we just need to get on with it. Yeah, so we need we did a lot to, a lot more investment in our infrastructure because I do believe, yeah, problem not a problem with electric cars, but when we're all plugging in at night, will our infrastructure be there to cope with it? Is the question of the future, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank Thanks, Rosemary. Claire? Thanks, Chair, and thanks to the uh, speakers so far. And I just, I really do want to thank um, the comments so far that are really trying to get us to focus on the, the devastating and unprecedented climate and biodiversity emergency that is here and it's upon us, and we're starting to, to live it. And we fully acknowledge that while our time is up, it's really unfortunate that what we've seen historically as climate denial has now become climate delayers. Um, but I assure you that the vast majority, if not all MLAs in this mandate want to see legislation pass this mandate. And it won't be a catch-all, it won't be a piece of legislation that will cover all things for all people. But what it will do is provide the building block and the foundation from which we can begin to move forward in a sustainable way to mitigate against the, the devastation that we're facing. Um, and I just I needed to put that into context. And while there will be scientific measures needed and political decisions being taken to deliver that one. I want to come back to the economics maybe behind it. And Neil, when you're talking about um, Sambit, um, we're, we're looking at that and you have raised it with us before. I want to ask you, what do you feel would be the financial impact on members if Northern Ireland sets in legislation anything other than net zero? Is there a discussion between your members in terms of future financial investment into their existing businesses or potential for maybe trade connections within their businesses? And Tim, you mentioned, I think I, I noted it down right, um, properly here, but please correct me if I'm wrong. And you're saying that as the circular economy begins to develop, that it, it, it was 39% you said that it could lead to 39% reduction in CO2 and I want to maybe come back to that one and explain to us about the economic opportunities that are there if we get this legislation right and begin to build those foundations that can lead us into the future. 
And, and Nika, you were talking about nature-based solutions and blue car carbon in our oceans and the marine protected habitats and peatland absorption. So I, I'm wondering, is a lot of that cross-border working that's going on? Um, how can we further strengthen the legislation in front of us to make sure that we can move forward to capitalise on those natural solutions as much as possible? Um. Neil, do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, just in the order, if that's okay, I'll, I'll do that. Thank you very much, and again, uh, thank you, um, Claire, for the question. So, uh, yeah, th three points to respond uh, on that. First, totally agree that we we need the legislation, and that's what our members are starting to tell us more and more now. We, we get it, right? Um, investors, interestingly, have told us and talked to us about that certainty and uncertainty uh, notion that uh, Nicola and, and, and Claire, you, you've mentioned. Um, and it's it's not even a point about what the target is. It's a point about what is the target so that we can uh, invest knowing what a return might be, et cetera, et cetera. So it's that whole thing about uh, a business owner through uh, the pandemic has always said to us, we almost don't care uh, what the guidance is. We, we just don't like the indecision around what it is. So tell us what it is and we'll do what we need to do. And the same principle per se applies here. Um, the, the sooner that we can get a framework and something to aim towards, the rest will, will fall into place. Uh, that's not me generalizing and taking one view or the other, but that's a premise that we hear all the time across various issues from multiple uh, members and business owners. That's really important to reiterate that. The third point then around investment, um, it's clear that in time, not now, but in time, you will likely only get investment into your business if you're demonstrating uh, your ESG, environmental social government uh, indicators, if you are sustainable, if you're doing X, Y, Z. It's also clear that in time, you'll likely only be able to bid for uh, government contracts if you're meeting a certain threshold and so on and so forth. So. Small businesses are knowing that now. The one, the ones that are pushing ahead are getting themselves in in, in order, um, and actually using that as a window of opportunity and advantage ahead of those that aren't. So I hope that answers the, the questions. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Tim just want to come back to you. Just maybe um, talk about the circular economy and its ability um, to. Um, be a lever in carbon reduction? I think it was the 39% that you said. I just want to know, has that been developed? Where's that figure come from? Um, and yeah. has that been mapped? Uh, and does that base just on Northern Ireland or is it island-wide? Is it islands-wide? Is it, you just, uh, give us a wee bit more question. detail. It's a great question. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, the, the 39 figure was a figure produced by Circular, Econo Circular Economy, uh, a, a Netherlands-based consultancy, and it was looking at the global emissions arising from uh, CO2 and what could be done or what, what could be achieved with the circular economy. Now, it, it's something that, that they were looking and saying, if we were to manage materials better in the supply chain, how can we better uh, minimize carbon, di carbon dioxide emissions? And the key areas they were focusing on was resource efficiency. So this is all the stuff like Kaizen Blitz and Six Sigma and all this stuff where you're actually minimizing the discard that occurs within the production cycle. You improve design, you improve functionality, uh, and that has a profound impact because something in the order of 80% of the impact of a product is embedded in that product at the design stage. Secondly, it's saying, move material up the waste hierarchy. Take it from landfill and move it to waste to energy. Take it from waste to energy and move it to recycling. Take it from recycling and move it to reuse. So move stuff up the waste hierarchy, away from a lower level. Yeah. But the third thing is, whatever mm -hmm. stuff you're left with, make sure you maximize what you can do with it. Yeah. Make sure you, you use it to the max. And it kind of aligns with what the Ellen MacArthur Foundation said going back oh, a dozen years almost now which was about, ultimately, you want stuff to, stuff to last for as long as possible. You want uh, to make sure that the stuff you have, um, you want to make sure that uh, it, uh, it's not going to damage the environment. So you're looking to detoxify it, and you're looking to, to minimize pollution. 
And ultimately, when you are discarding stuff, you're making sure that it either regenerates nature or that you maximize its value as much as possible. Yeah. You valorize materials. Um, mm. Understood. I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of calls on this kind of stuff, seeing as I've been talking about it for a while, from a number of sectors. And many of them are saying, we haven't quite got our head around what this means. Yeah. Now, for Northern Ireland, there is work going on within the Department of, Department of Economy. And the Circular Economy Network is looking specifically at that. And that Circular Economy uh, consultancy is doing work with the Department for Economy, looking at what this means directly for Northern Ireland. But the 39% figure was a figure designed to feed into the COP26 discussions. Now, it's interesting in COP26 because waste wasn't really discussed at COP26 because it was just looking, when you consider waste, it only generates about 4 to 5% of the overall carbon dioxide emissions, but that's just the treatment and disposal. If you look at the, where waste is generated through the system, there's waste generated throughout the system. And one of the first things you saw walking into COP26 was a stall all around textile wastes. Because textile wastes, as Claire, you will know, is a phenomenally wasteful process, as is food manufacture is also terribly wasteful. Um, but those are conversations not for now, I think. Um, but that figure, that report, if anyone's interested, I can make it available to the, to the committee. Thank you. I'd be, appreciate that if you could, please. And then, Anika, looking at, obviously, then peatlands and blue carbon and our oceans, um, they are ongoing. They're, you know, regardless of what you think politically, do you know what I mean? They're not the, something that Northern Ireland can do on its own. We've got our neighbours in the Republic. We've got Scotland, England and Wales and the oceans and the marines and the peatlands around those as well. But I want to go back to that cross-border work. And if we don't get this legislation right, set ourselves on a path different from Scotland, England, Wales and south of Ireland, do you foresee that being a problem in terms of that level of working? Well, I think there's already been a lot of cross-border learnings through um, things like the Collaborative Action for the Natura Network project, which was Interreg funded and spans um, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland. And there's six sites, actually, uh, six special areas of conservation within Northern Ireland that are benefiting from that project. And what that's really allowed to happen is, you know, that shared learning of how to restore peatlands and to make sure that we're able to embed those skills and knowledge in multiple regions so in the Republic of Ireland Northern Ireland and also in, in Scotland in many cases that that interreg program will cover um, going forward certainly there's been a lot of collaboration more widely in the UK and and in Ireland on how to restore and manage these habitats but fundamentally if we end up with kind of very different funding mechanisms and approaches then there would be a significant disparity to that approach um, between the borders and there's also a great deal of expertise now dotted around that we want to be able to continue to draw on um, and I know there is a, a new sort of academic research network um, which is an all-island network that aims to really harness that for both biodiversity and climate research. And we just really want to emphasize that we've learned a lot through doing these sorts of collaborative projects, and we want to make sure that we still do that. But fundamentally, there needs to be similar approaches and levels of investment. And as mentioned um, earlier in your discussion on the environment strategy, there are clear guidelines and advice given by the Climate Change Committee on what our targets should be for peatland restoration and similarly for, for woodland park planting. Um, the only thing that isn't yet in there is blue carbon because that's at a slightly earlier stage. We don't have yet any restoration projects in Northern Ireland. There are lots of blue carbon restoration projects in the rest of the UK and um, there are a few starting in the Republic of Ireland. So we're very keen that we do start to pick up the pace and, and get blue carbon restoration um, going as well because all these things take a while to really yield results and they need significant long-term investment to do so. Thanks very much and Nicola thank you very much I'm going to leave you alone I think you've got a lot of questions there but I want to just say thank you very much for pointing out exactly why and how with the stats that Northern Ireland is absolutely a climate laggard thank you it might look beautiful but you know careful with the air you're breathing and the water that you're swimming <coughs> in but thank you. Thank, thank you uh, Claire just uh a couple of questions for myself. So I, I think uh, for Dr. Clemens, you, you, you laboured on nature-based solutions 
Uh, and, and you seem to indicate that we, you know, you, you were suggesting that we should follow the approach of both the South and Scotland, who have contained that within their their, their build. Is there a difference? You know, are they both coming at it from the same angle, or, or is there a different approach within either of those two with regard to nature-based solutions? Um, I think the interesting thing is literally in the wording. Um, so in the Republic of Ireland, they've called these nature-based projects because sometimes the term nature-based solution make it sound as if you can reach an endpoint, job done, walk away, whereas they're using the term nature-based projects and they very much embedded the biodiversity outcomes as well as the climate uh, outcomes and not just mitigation. So it's not just about locking away the carbon, but it's also about about adaptation so it's about supporting climate resilience so I think the terminology nature-based projects that's being used in the Republic of Ireland legislation is potentially um, a, a good fit but the Scottish one is also you know a good um, approach as well so the main thing is there is there is wording available and certainly I understand that the RSPB um, briefing before their oral evidence last month also included potential clause wording and they had got you know um, experts to actually look at what might be best here. Okay thank you thanks. Just, uh, I'm going to turn to N Neil then. Neil, in terms of the the, the Sambit, uh, I mean, because obviously, you know, a anybody drafting a bill would, would like to ensure that there's adequate consultation and, uh, you know, particularly in a, in a region where small and medium enterprises are prim primary in, in our economy. I mean, are you, are you sensing or suggesting that the just transition, or I mean, any uh, any direction of just transition on this bill uh, isn't uh, going to be sufficient to uh, deal with that issue. And then, just just, just for clarity, I mean, you, you're raising the issue of Sam, but I mean, essentially, as a uh, as a responsibility of the Department for the Economy. So you, you're trying to get it included into the climate bill because the Department Department for the Economy are essentially not doing what they're supposed to do. Am I correct in that? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I fully understand the first question, so I'll maybe ask the, the second first, and then if you could clarify, that would be really useful. Um, so the Department of the Economy is the, is the host site, as it were, and the, the host or lead department, but it's cross-executive by way of uh, best practice guidance. Uh, and so that's the first thing to clarify. The, the second thing is that we are um, we are concerned that it's it's inconsistently used and because it doesn't have a statutory footing, um, we, we pretty much realize and, and understand from officials that that's the reason. And so when you're told that by officials uh, and you, you represent small um, uh, businesses right across NI, um, it seems like the, one of the biggest areas that we're gonna um, have a shift and, and perhaps have impacts of which we don't know is climate change. And so we thought that um, this would be the best thing to propose for both the number one and, and number two bills uh, on the basis that uh, without it, the same thing that happened in other policy making strands would happen on this. And that's the, that's the basic premise. We, we don't seek to, to change or, or shift any of the, the targets uh, in any way. All we, all we aim to do with it is to maximise the, the quality of the policy making process that, that stems from uh, any legislative target. So that's part two, hopefully, uh, answered. Would you be able to clarify just part one around the, the just transition? I, 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 pro I probably asked it very clumsily. I'm just thinking if, you know, if, if there was a consultation period in, in the bill and also proper just transition principles within the bill, would either of those combined satisfy what it is you're looking for without the specific uh, uh, mention of Sam, but that's essentially what I'm trying to get to. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think that that is absent from, from this bill. So, but, but if it were to be in place and there was a something around consultation and, and best practice that was mandated, we, we certainly would bring it closer and um, perhaps in the in the exploratory memorandum as well, if if it um, talked a little bit about what you should be doing, then that would that would help. 
Um, but I have to say, I don't think we'd have 100% confidence unless that, that this was written in, uh, as we've suggested in our consultation response, how that could be done. If, if that wasn't done, I'm not sure we could stand over it and, and be confident that the engagement would take place to the, the, the right level. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Neil. And uh, I'd better just check before I say that, but I, I don't think there's any other... Uh, there's no, nobody else has indicated that they want to speak. So just before the chair takes his seat and, and resumes chairing the meeting, can I just thank all of you for coming along today and uh, given, given the evidence, it was really much appreciated. I know it's your second time with us, uh, so I really appreciate the time that you're giving us and the, and the evidence that you are providing to the committee and its work. So thank you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Wasn't time, there. <laughs> <laughs> We're just point eleven, chair. Point eleven. Okay, members. Um, members, we're moving on to item number eleven. is correspondence, page two hundred sixteen in your packs. I'd like to draw your attention to some um, correspondence in the table pack as well from the department. In response to. Uh, Question on the delays relating to common frameworks. The department has advised that some of the cross cutting issues preventing progress were addressed in a meeting on the 20th uh, in September. A follow up meeting with representatives from all jurisdictions is planned in early November. The department provided a response to the committee's request for a timetable of upcoming strategy briefings. The agriculture policy framework is scheduled for the 25th of November. The bovine uh, briefing for the 9th of December. The rural policy uh, analysis of the responses will be ready. For Minister's consideration in mid-November, and subject to approval, a copy of this analysis will be brought to the committee. In the Ammonia strategy, the Minister is actively considering this, and the Department has the public to consul publish the consultation soon. Um, okay. Um, okay. The committee uh, wrote to the Department to seek an update on the work being undertaken by AFPE and Chagask in relation to uh, carbon sequestration. The Department has advised that QUB, AFBE and Chagas are working together on several projects, including evaluating the feasibility of organic soil in terms of sequestration, effective reseeding and liming on intensively managed uh, soil stocks, novel me methods of reducing on-farm emissions, including impact of different feeds, future modelling of THG emissions from land use and agriculture. Um, Remember any questions or comments you want to make in relation to that there? Um, do, you see, do you see that last point there, um, members? I, 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 I just, I'm very, this carbon benchmarking is something very interesting in, and, and this joint work, but possible maybe to get to maybe a bit more detailed up on that update on that there, um, maybe on an ongoing basis because it has loads of potentials for addressing many of the issues that we discussed previously in the meeting uh, here today. Um, yeah, okay. Are members okay that we action the rest of the correspondence in the index sheet as suggested? Yeah. Members? In number 12 is the forward work programme. Um, the draft work programme is page 232. Can you seek agreement with this, please? Great. And Great. And members of, oh, I'm going to check my WhatsApp group. Is there, do many members of any other business that want to raise? Chair, just on the forward work programme, maybe AOB as well. Um, I just want to clarify, I know we're due to go through clause by clause. This is something that I don't have sole control over as well, mm. because we're working with the Bills office. Um, so I will do everything possible to make sure that the Bill's ready for clause by clause analysis. Um, and I'll certainly keep in touch with um, Nick as clerk uh, and keep you informed along the way. Hopefully everything should be fine. I just need to flag that up, but sometimes it's out of my control. Are you looking at that? I mean, I'm just scared that we close. I mean, I, I, I'm seeking clarification that when the meeting ends, we're, we're going back into closed session. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. So, members, the next meeting will take place next Thursday, the 18th of November at 10 a.m., and a hybrid meeting streamed on the assembly website. So we'll adjourn to go back into the mm -hmm. session again. Okay.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.